One of the ways Trump was expected to pay for his mounting legal bills was through his Twitter knockoff, Truth Social. Last month, Trump took that company public, and thanks to investments from Trump's loyal supporters, the value of his shares rose to more than $4 billion, despite the fact that Truth Social is losing money and has fewer users than any social media company that has ever gone public before. Since then, Trump's stock has literally been in free fall. The company has already lost more than $2 billion of value since that first day of trading. It lost 10% of its value just today, its worst day of trading yet, which may not be a great sign for a stock that has been shorted by a lot of its major investors. But that's not the only problem with Trump's media company. Trump first launched Truth Social with the help of two former Apprentice contestants who became his business partners. Those two former Apprentice contestants have now sued Trump, alleging that Trump was trying to cheat them out of their share of the profits from Truth Social. And that lawsuit has taken an interesting turn. On April 15th, Trump will have to sit for a deposition in the case brought by those two ex-business partners, which is notable, not just because the notoriously untruthful president will once again have to give testimony under oath. It is also notable because April 15th is the scheduled start date for Trump's criminal hush money trial here in Manhattan. Happy tax day! Today, CBS News reports that more than 500 New Yorkers have already been sent notices to appear as potential jurors in this historic trial, which means we are now just 10 days away from Donald Trump, a former American president, actually standing trial as a criminal defendant for the very first time. Joining me now is Christy Greenberg, a former federal prosecutor and former deputy chief of the criminal division for the Southern District of New York. Christy, thanks for joining me every day. It's like I get a mini lesson in line, like going to have a law degree by 2027. <laughs> I get a little small lesson in how it all works. But the jury selection process, I think that there's a lot about it that people don't know. And and this one in particular is going to be historic, right? Um, just big picture, how difficult is it going to be to select a jury in Manhattan that doesn't know that much about what Trump's been up to? So it's fine if the jury knows what he's been up to. I mean, you kind of have to be living under a rock mm -hmm. not to know that he's running and that he has called the various cases against him a witch hunt. But the question really for both sides is, can they put whatever opinions they have about Donald Trump, the candidate, or what they've heard about this case in the press, can they put that aside and just evaluate the instructions on the law and mm -hmm. the evidence that they are going to hear at the trial? Can they put aside what their con preconceived notions are and be impartial? That's really the question. And so you can expect in a case like this an even more detailed questioning of these potential jurors. A lot about their backgrounds, a lot about what have you heard? Have you heard Trump's statements blasting Alvin Bragg and calling him an animal and all these terrible things? And what do you think about do that? Do you read the newspaper? I mean, <laughs> what newspapers do yes. you read? Where do you get your news from? And how has it affected your opinions? Can you put opinions that you have aside and listen to the evidence? Those are the kinds of questions that both sides will really be asking. There, um, CBS News reports that they are going to be using jury specialists to find jurors. For people who don't know what a jury specialist is, what do they do exactly? Uh, they're basically going to stalk the jurors and learn everything they can about them. Uh, learn, you know, their backgrounds. What have they been doing on social media? Um, you know, do they have opinions on politics on this president, on these cases that they have expressed at, at any point. Um, and just generally, what are their backgrounds? I mean, certain backgrounds of uh, individuals, you know, whether people have families, whether they have established employment, like certain, there are certain kinds of witness uh, jurors that you're going to look for as a prosecutor that you may want to sit, jurors that... Um, that have sat before and they haven't been able to reach a verdict on a case. That's kind of a red That's flag a red for flag. prosecutors. Those who, um, you know, don't really trust the government and, you know, believe a lot of disinformation. One of the questions that the prosecutors want to ask is, do you believe the election was stolen? Right. Hugely important question, because if you believe that, then you're somebody who's unlikely to really buy much of what the prosecution is going to be arguing. I would imagine that the vetting process is similar to sort of the targeted campaign outreach that they make to voters, like certain habits, reading habits, 
job industries are going to be tells for certain political proclivities, right? Right. And, you know, are you affiliated with certain associations? And that doesn't mean necessarily are you a Democrat or a Republican, even how you voted. That's that's pretty much off limits, or it should be off limits, though Trump's team wants those questions. Um, but yeah, what, what kind of associations do you, um, are you affiliated with? Yeah, where do you get your news from? And more importantly, yeah, are you somebody who's going to be more susceptible to conspiracy theories, to not buying that what, you know, what the government is arguing? Those are the kinds of things that consultants looking at your background can get a pretty good sense of. And they don't want stealth jurors either, right? Because there are a lot of people out there on the left and on the right who know the historical import of this and just want to be jurors and could theoretically mask themselves as kind of impartial or unknowing potential candidates for the jury. Right, and that is that is what is going to keep D.A. Bragg up at night. Yeah. Because on most cases, you have people who are trying to find any excuse not to sit on the jury. Um, they are they are really doing their best, and you know those people. that you know Any question, their hand is up. They've got something to say. They need a sidebar with the judge. Like You can tell those people. Here, I think that's going to be less of the issue because it is such a historic case. This is the first criminal uh, trial involving a president. And you can see people, even if they think the answer is yes, the election was stolen, well, I'm not going to, I know why they're asking that, and I really want to be seated, so I'm not going to tell you what I really think. And that's where jury consultants, I think, really will be important, it's particularly Gene Wilder for is the needed <laughs> yes. and all of his computer screens. But I mean, you know, there's a, there's a threat that Judge Marshawn has put out there, right, in the context of expanding this gag order to include Marshawn's family members, in the context of making these very art articulate arguments for what Donald Trump is doing to the rule of law and why he needs to be, you know, gagged, for lack of a better term. He has also said that if, if Trump continues to mouth off, if he continues to destroy the integrity or attempt to destroy the integrity of those involved in this prosecution, he will lose access to the jurors' names. That means, can you just clarify what, what that means and the significance of that? So this is the real sanction out of that gag order. This is the real thing that I think Trump and his lawyers probably looked at and said, oh, okay, maybe we have to, <laughs> maybe we have to get it, shut him up and make sure that he complies with this, uh, which is why I think you're seeing actually the, the very attacks on the uh, judge's daughter now being taken up by his lawyers as an end run around that gag order. But this sanction is is important because the prosecutors, they would have access to the jury's name. They would get to do all that background research on these jurors, whereas Trump and his team would not know their names. They would only know the answers to the questions. They wouldn't really be able to fact check huh. by doing the research and knowing, OK, like, let's Google, let's look at their social media, let's do all of that research. They wouldn't have the names to be able to do that. That's a big deal, a right? Big because deal. I, 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 again, from courtroom dramas, sorry, Gene Hackman, not Gene Wilder. I do know. I mean, I think all of us have seen the way in which you, the prosecution and the defense both create sort of profiles in their minds as they're developing their arguments and thinking about what they're going to say about who, the men and women that they're talking to. And if you don't know, other than the responses to their questions, that seems like you're really fighting with one hand tied behind your back. Yes, it would be a huge disadvantage. And so I think given that, you're going to see at least Donald Trump try to stay just within the boundaries of that gag order, that he is pushing the limits even by reposting what other people are posting. Yeah, and that's just, I mean, the, the, the climate, the relationship that this defense already has with this judge seems so poisoned that I would imagine, you know, it's not unobvious. It's not the most subtle thing to say, that seems problematic, right? That is, that is not, I mean... It seems like a big, big deal that they have this hugely antagonistic relationship with the judge that's presiding over this case. They do. And in most cases, you wouldn't see a criminal defendant who try to antagonize the judge who, if he is convicted, will end up sentencing him. That's not a dynamic you typically see. Maybe after the conviction, you have some words, or after a sentencing, you're upset and you want to appeal, but not before. But again, he is trying to do a number of things. He wants to delay the trial. He wants to distract from his conduct so that everybody is just focused on these attacks and these frivolous filings. We're not talking about what he actually did. And mass disruption. That is the third yeah. aspect of what he's trying to do. Intimidate jurors, intimidate uh, you know, witnesses get people to maybe not show up or not say things that will be bad to him. I mean, he's really just trying to delegitimize the entire process. And this judge, I think, has really done a good job of trying to just 
you know, stay the course and, you know, really not get emotional and just try to, you know, give rulings that are fair. Yeah, in the name of um, justice. Hey everyone, MSNBC has a new and improved app. You'll get real-time alerts and analysis, live blogs, in-depth essays, video highlights, and the best 2024 election coverage. Download the new MSNBC app. Here's how to do it. You tap on the App Store on your phone. You hit search on the bottom right corner. You type in MSNBC. You click on the MSNBC app. You click on get or the cloud icon and enjoy it.